Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, the Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College for hosting us this morning. Uh, the Silberman School and Hunter College is a big partner of ours, so we also thank them for that. Uh, and so I want to thank you, Frank Sanchez, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at CUNY, for being here. Um, President Jennifer Robb of Hunter College, uh, I want to thank you for hosting us as well. Um, we have lots of members of the administration here who we want to uh, thank, and uh, they've all been working incredibly hard on the announcement that we're making today. Uh, DOHMH Commissioner Dr. Mary Bassett. So because there are a lot of them, we should probably like just sort of applaud through. Uh, DOHMH Executive Deputy Commissioner of Mental Hygiene, Dr. Derek Gary Belkin. DOHMH Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Family and Child Health, Dr. George Askew. The Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Liz Glazer. The Director of the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs, Commissioner Lori Sutton. Department of Homeless Services, Deputy Commissioner for Family Services, Jamani Hilton. ACS Deputy Commissioner for Policy Planning and Management, Andrew White. ACS Deputy Commissioner for Early Care and Education, Laura Lai Vargas. New York Police Department, Deputy Commissioner Susan Herman. Uh, Deputy Chief of Staff to the First Lady, uh, Jackie Bray. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Richard Beery. <laughs> we know who you are, and you're great. Thank you. I, that wasn't for applause, just, um, uh, we have a number of elected officials here this morning also, Congressman Charlie Rangel. Assemblyman David Weprin, <laughs> Assemblyman Robert Rodriguez, <laughs> Assemblywoman Joanne Simon. So we are gathered today to announce the release of Thrive NYC. I know many New Yorkers have been waiting for this announcement, and rightfully so, because mental health impacts all New Yorkers. Today, New York City steps up. Today we shine a bright light on this crisis, and today we start on the path to change. So to begin, it is my honor to introduce one of those New Yorkers. She is Kathy Gardini, Program Director at the Queens Family Resource Center, and she is here to share with us her story. Kathy? Just bear with me a moment. He introduced me. Yes, my name is Kathy Gardini. I'm a mom of two and a grandmother of four. Okay, let me just pull this together. At the age of six, my son was diagnosed with ADHD and moved along to a mood disorder. I was alone, didn't know what the word advocate meant, didn't even know how to advocate for my, advocate for my son. And after working in a mental health and substance abuse program, I was just embarrassed to ask for help. I sat at my desk one day and I did nothing but cry. And I cried. One of the social workers came over and she asked me what was wrong. At that point, I told her my story. And she looked at me and she said, Kathy, you surrounded by all the help in the world. All you had to do was ask. I just couldn't ask. She slipped me a telephone number from this wonderful psychiatrist that helped me. When I said help me, the school that he was in, he was in a Catholic school, and all they kept telling me was calling me on my phone, come get your son. We don't know what to do with him. You need to get help. He needs to be on medication. He needs this, he needs that, but giving me no direction. I went to the psychiatrist, and he said, Kathy, I'm going to help you with this. He said, it's going to start with an evaluation. And I go, what, what is that? 
He said you're going to need an IEP meeting from District 75. Who are they? No clue. Sorry that I was clueless. He set up that meeting for me. This psychiatrist came to this meeting with me and he guided me. I didn't have much money to pay him. He said, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to help you advocate for your son. At that point, he was in a school that had these resources and not one person in this school was able to help me until I got that IEP. When I got that IEP, the principal pulled me to the side and she said, the IEP will pay for this, but you're gonna have to come up with $353 to pay. I didn't have $353 a month. I had to move my son out of a Catholic school into a District 75. What was that? That same psychiatrist told me, I'm gonna need some help. What help? I'm going to need people to help me with this. Now I know it's called a support team. Back then, I didn't know what that meant. I had to rely on a cab driver that I've just met and build up a rapport to take my son to these appointments before I lose my job. The cab driver. My oldest daughter at that time was 16 years old. I had to rely on her after school to help me with my son. You know how that made me less than a mom because I didn't know where to go. But now I have to say advocating that I'm standing here before you as a program director working with children from zero, parents with children from zero to 24, where I can give back that help that I was taught. I have to say that my son is now a youth advocate working in the Family Resource Center, giving back and helping youth, teens, tweens with these issues. You know, when I got this call from the mayor's office and the team, I was in crisis mode again. And everything I know again went out the window. My 17-year-old's grandson was going through a crisis. Stopped taking his medication when he was diagnosed with ADHD. Turned to the street pills, alcohol, marijuana. Am I embarrassed to say that now? No, because I was sitting in a training, even though I went blank. The instructor, we was doing the exercise, and she said, you have a piece of paper in front of you. If you have 15 minutes to speak to someone, and when she said speak to someone, 15 minutes, what's five questions you would ask? And you know why she said the five? because you can count them on one hand. So I went and I wrote down five questions. And by me working for a substance abuse program, I asked for a favor. I was not embarrassed. I called the CEO of that substance abuse program. And he said, Kathy, give me your daughter's telephone number, her name, go find your grandson, because at that point he was missing. I said, why I do this, you find him. And before I wrapped up that 15 minutes, that program had a van downstairs in front of my daughter's door, taking him off to treatment. I've learned all of this, and I'm standing here before you advocating for parents with children with these issues. And I was on the mayor's life, um, roadmap to New York City. I participate in the questions so we can actually put an end to this stigma. I'm actually the co-chair of an anti-stigma work group so we can take the stigma away and off the street. We have too many people out here walking around that do not know where to go get help. And if we take that stigma away, we can all, everyone in this room can help. And that's what I have to say. That's my story.
Wow. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, uh, it takes such great courage to share your experience, and I want to thank you for doing so. I also want to acknowledge two uh, more folks that have come. Councilman Idanis Rodriguez. Thank you. And Assemblyman Luis Sepulveda. So, you know, Kathy speaks very powerfully about the problem of stigma. We know that stigma and fear can play a role in preventing people from seeking the care they need. It influences how individuals with mental illness are viewed and how they view themselves. When it comes to mental health, we need a culture change. We know that it will not happen overnight. It will take time, resources, and coordination. But most of all, it takes leadership. Here to tell us about Thrive New York City, New York's roadmap for mental health for all, is a woman whose honesty and openness have inspired us all, and whose leadership is the reason we are here today. Please join me in welcoming the chair of the Mayor's Fund and the First Lady of the City of New York, Shirlane McRae. Thank you so much, Rich. Thank you, Kathy, for that incredibly moving story, which is your life. Um, thank you, family, for being here with me today. Um, I'm never as happy as when my family is with me um, and hope that what I have to say today brings hope to families all across our city. Kathy, your story brings hope to everyone who believes that each of us has the power to make a real and lasting difference in the world. Standing here with us today, elected officials, advocates, commissioners, medical experts, and community leaders, on behalf of all of you and on behalf of the hundreds of other New Yorkers who contributed their energy and experience to this project, it is my great pleasure to announce the release of Thrive NYC, a mental health roadmap for all. Thrive NYC is a plan of action, a decisive turning point in the way our city approaches mental health and substance use disorders. The roadmap includes 54 initiatives, 23 of which are brand new. It includes an investment of $850 million over the next four years. And it includes previously unpublished data, eye-opening maps and user guides for common mental health conditions. With this roadmap, New York is stepping up and taking on a crisis that has been eroding the foundation of our city and destroying our families for far too long. Our work on the roadmap officially began 11 months ago when we launched this effort. But for me, for Bill, and for so many of our partners, the journey to this moment started a long time ago. In my case, the journey started with my parents, who both suffered from depression. It continued with members of my extended family who struggled, who struggled with substance misuse and polar disorder, bipolar disorder. It continued with a close childhood friend who took her own life. And it continued with our remarkable daughter, Chiara, who is here with us today, along with her equally remarkable brother, Dante. <laughs> Many of you know that a few years ago, Kiara revealed to Bill and me that she was suffering from addiction, anxiety, and depression. Well, today, she is well into recovery and shares her story to inspire other young people seeking help. So mental illness has always been a part of my life, a part of my family. And my guess is that if you think about it, and if you know the signs and symptoms, and remember, it has been part of yours too. For almost a year, I've been traveling across the city talking about mental health. In every room, every neighborhood, every borough, 
I ask people to raise their hand if they have not been affected by mental illness. No one has ever raised their hand. And I'm sure that this room is no different. Maybe you are the parent of a teenager whose anxiety is so overwhelming that every conversation is a struggle. Maybe you have a friend who has completely lost control over his drinking. Maybe you know an elderly relative or a neighbor who barely leaves her house anymore. But for all of the maybes, this much is certain. All of you know someone who has been touched by mental illness. Just look at the statistics. At least one in five adult New Yorkers is dealing with mental health condition. And it's not just the adults who are suffering. Mental illness and substance use disorders can strike at any stage of life, from childhood on. Again, the statistics bear this out. 8% of public high school students in New York City report attempting suicide. 26% of CUNY undergrads who responded to a campus survey reported experiencing significant anxiety. More than 13% of senior citizens receiving home health care have major depression. And I want you to know, when we talk about depression, we are not talking about having the blues for a couple of days. We're not talking about a little sadness for a couple of days. We're talking about serious serious depression, which I think Kiara said it well when describing her own experience. And she said, every morning brings an existential struggle of epic proportions as I try to decide whether or not I have the strength to make it out of bed or if it would even be worth it to go through the motions of another hopeless day. So let me be clear, depression is an illness, a disease, one that affects more than half a million New Yorkers. When you consider all the statistics, and when you think about all the suffering, dysfunction, and fear those statistics represent, it becomes impossible to avoid a painful truth. We are facing a public health crisis. Too many New Yorkers in every community are not getting the treatment they need. That's the bad news. The good news is that mental illness is treatable. We know what works. We have the tools. We just aren't using them. So what we need is a public health solution, one that engages every sector of our city, one that meets the needs of every community and age group. The Roadmap's 54 initiatives reflect this reality. With this roadmap, we are sending a message that we will no longer ignore suffering, that we know how to fix. Right now, despite the best efforts of many smart and dedicated people, finding the right mental health resources you need is like being dropped into a foreign city with no map and only a vague knowledge of the language. We wander down streets that lead to nowhere, we are forced to rely on the advice of strangers who don't understand us, despite their best intentions. And after a while, we start wondering if we'd be better off just giving up. But giving up is never a good response. What New Yorkers need is more resources, better resources, resources that are easy to access. And that is exactly what we're creating with Thrive NYC. In launching 54 initiatives, we are massively expanding our city's capacity to treat mental illness and promote mental health. Now, our work is grounded in best practices and shaped by six guiding principles based on hundreds of conversations with medical experts, community leaders, and individual New Yorkers who know firsthand the pain of mental illness. From them, we learn the importance of changing the culture we need to make mental health everyone's business. And from them, we came to appreciate the wisdom of acting early. If we give New Yorkers more tools to weather life's challenges, we can prevent mental illness from taking root. And for them, we are making a long-term commitment to close treatment gaps. We need to provide every New Yorker with access to the right care in the right place at the right time. So for example, 
For our youngest New Yorkers, we will expand social emotional learning to all pre-K and early learn sites. Because every child needs to help, every child needs help developing skills, the skills they need to make sense of their emotions and adapt to new situations. And no child should be punished for untreated conduct disorders. Right? What kind of society are we if we do that, right? For our elementary, middle, and high school students, we will bring new mental health resources to, hun to hundreds of high-need public schools. Because our schools should be a place where students can get help for any issue that is threatening their intellectual or emotional development. For thousands of CUNY students, we'll launch web and mobile-based ways for them to quickly and easily access help with assistance from CUNY School of Public Health. Because if we want college students to graduate and excel, we need to provide them with mental health tools that are as dynamic and innovative as our young people themselves. For New Yorkers who are battling an addiction to opioids, we will train and authorize at least 1,000 new providers to prescribe buprenorphine. <laughs> I'm doing that. <laughs> buprenorphine. <laughs> yeah, try and say that three times quickly. Uh, this medication stops cravings and prevents withdrawal symptoms. And because we have a moral and medical obligation to make sure no one who needs it goes without life-saving medication. For all New Yorkers, we will create a mental health core that will send hundreds of physicians and social workers out into the neighborhoods where they are needed most. This core will provide 400,000 hours of outpatient care every year. And that care will be aligned with the goals and principles in the roadmap, ensuring the long-term sustainability of Thrive NYC. Because when trained professionals are also passionate community members, services are easier to access and culturally competent. And for all New Yorkers, we will launch NYC support a program finder to help people quickly and easily find resources that match their unique needs. If a New Yorker needs help, NYC support will be there for them 24-7, 365 days a year. And why are we doing that? Because we can all use a guide when it comes to navigating the mental health system. Speaking of guides, I have, been, I have been blessed with many great ones, but I want to recognize three by name. As he proved with Pre-K, no one is better at keeping big, ambitious projects on track than Deputy Mayor Rich Bury. Right? <laughs> and his leadership will be even more valuable as we put the roadmap into action. Dr. Mary Bassett, our health commissioner, has never wavered in her commitment to this work. This is a woman who lives and breathes community health, a woman who knows how to get services to where they are needed. And I am especially proud to count Dr. Gary Belkin, Executive Deputy Commissioner of our Division of Mental Hygiene, I am so proud to count him as a staunch friend and partner. Gary is a visionary. There's really no other way to say it. And he has poured a lifetime of his, of his experience into this roadmap. Thank you so much, Dr. Belkin. Of course, city government cannot do this alone. The work we are announcing here today is a first step. In order to achieve our goals, we need everyone to do their part, because we all have a role to play. 
That's why we will create opportunities for 250,000 New Yorkers to receive training and mental health first aid, which teaches people how to help friends, family members, and coworkers who may be suffering. And that's why we will recruit peer specialists. To <laughs> you see, peer specialists, I heard you. <laughs> hey, peer specialists in the house. We will recruit peer specialists to put their life experiences to work. And that's why we are encouraging all New Yorkers to listen closely the next time they hear someone mention that they are suffering. Now you will notice that all of these actions in involve collaboration. And that's not a coincidence. This is a people problem and it requires a people solution. If we work together, we can change the mindset around the mind. If we work together, we can make it as easy to talk about anxiety as it is to talk about allergies. If we work together, we can create a city where every New Yorker can live their life to the fullest. A city where every New Yorker can thrive. And now for our Spanish-speaking neighbors. Hoy estamos anunciando Thrive NYC, una nueva visión y estrategia para abordar necesidades de servicios de salud mental en nuestra ciudad. Este, no, este nuevo plan incluye 54 iniciativas para ayudar a los neoyorqueños con problemas de salud mental. Trabajando juntos, podemos crear una ciudad en la que todos tengan la oportunidad de disfrutar una vida sana y productiva. It is now my pleasure to introduce a man whose commitment to creating a truly effective mental health system extends beyond his responsibilities as mayor. It is rooted in his experiences as a son, as a husband, and as a father. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Bill de Blasio. I feel <clears throat> such gratitude at this moment for everything that Sherlane has devoted herself to and what it's going to mean for the people of this city. But even more so, I feel such pride. And for Chiara and Dante and I, this is a moment for our family to celebrate someone who is the core of everything in our family, Sherlane McRae. And Sherlane, I will tell you, in married life, she has often reminded me to listen. <laughs> know what I'm talking about, peer specialists? <laughs> so she lived by her own values, and she went out over the city over the last year all around this city <clears throat> and listened to people. She listened to the experts. And she listened to everyday New Yorkers. She listened to parents who were searching for help. She listened to young people. She listened to seniors. And she listened to people from all different communities. And she would tell me each night what she experienced. And it was a passionate work for her, a labor of love. And each time she came back with even more desire to help and to make sure People were reached. They were reached in a language they could understand in a way that would actually make a difference in their lives. So she literally channeled the people of this city into this work. And it's important to understand 
This that she produced, Thrive NYC. This is a roadmap rooted in human reality. This is about actually responding to the lives of our people the way they really are lived and helping them to live better. Sherlane is always one to work in collaboration with others. She mentioned some of her great collaborators in this effort, Deputy Mayor Bury, Commissioner Bassett, uh, Executive Deputy Commissioner Belkin, and so many others. Sherlane created a, a team environment, and that's why you see a work of such extraordinary scope. And what is so clear in all that Sherlane said to us is that mental health challenges can frame the entire life of an individual or even a whole family. That's the reality. Something that happens in the tra trajectory of someone's life, something that happens to their mental health can create an uh, irreparable reality. Or it could be something that we recognize and treat, and in some cases even a reality that turns around and leaves someone stronger. I know uh, from my own experiences both sides of that spectrum. I certainly saw in my father, and I say this with real sorrow, I saw what happens when a problem is not addressed. I saw what happens when someone's suffering and doesn't know where to turn for help or can't be reached. And for my father, it was a very different time, obviously. It was a time where it was even harder to talk about these issues or, or understand them. Uh, in the 1940s, he went off to war, he went off, he volunteered to serve his country, served in the Pacific in the Army, unfortunately in some of the bloodiest battles of that war, including the Battle of Okinawa, lost half a leg, came back with what we thought was a permanent physical challenge. We thought, as children, we thought, I'm sure so many people around him, here's someone who was a hero and has a physical scar for what he did for his country. That was not even the half of it, because the, the mental challenge was so much greater. We would call it PTSD today. We'd have many words for it. But we didn't have those words back then. We didn't have that idea. We didn't understand what it means for someone to have gone through that kind of agony and pain to have seen so much suffering and what it does to them. And we didn't even know how to think about what it meant for a family. I remember for years thinking, my father has a problem, a challenge, it's a physical challenge, and oh, he's also an alcoholic. I literally didn't put the two together for the longest time, and I think a lot of other people in our society didn't, especially with our returning veterans. We didn't want to say, that the pain of their service, the pain they brought back from their service, was at the core of all these challenges. But it affected us all, every single member of our family. As someone said to me once, that war never ended for our family, because it was with us every single day. And then, when his alcoholism became acute, except for trying to talk him into seeking help, there was no more sophisticated understanding of what to do, and my father brushed off every attempt to get him help. And that's essentially where it ended. We didn't know how to do anything different. We were a family that had our strengths, but we didn't know how to do anything that would break through. It felt like the unmovable reality. Two generations later, I could have felt myself on a similar road, and Sherlane could have felt herself on a similar road to the one she saw, a very different reality, but a very painful one she saw with her parents and other members of her family. But there was a real difference. Kiara came forward with strength and honesty about her challenges, and we all got to the work of trying to figure it out. And I will not lie to you, despite all that we are blessed to have, we didn't know 
what to do next. Many, many times there was an unclear path. But over time, largely due to Charlene's extraordinary devotion and her constant research and Chiara's extraordinary commitment to her recovery, we found a pathway. And I want you to know that there are so many good things to learn when someone finds their way. Chiara taught us so much. She made Sherlane and Dante and I very proud in the process. She taught us a lot about strength and character. She taught us about things we didn't know about, like Alcoholics Anonymous, and how in that program there was a value put on helping the next person. And Chiara threw herself into that work and was able to help so many others. But before I talk about what we're here to do going forward, I just have to put one more point on this. I never got to know everything about my father I would have liked to, because by the time I knew him, he was already really starting to decline. But I do know he was a war hero. I do know he showed tremendous leadership during battle. There's plenty of evidence of that. I do know he was highly educated. He went to the same university Dante goes to now. He would be so proud of Dante. And he would be so proud of Chiara. But the difference is, and he was about my size, only even stronger built, much stronger built from his wartime service. He was strong and he was smart. But he couldn't do what Chiara did. I often thought about that. He never got to meet his granddaughter, but he could not do what she was able to do. And that says something about maybe the fact that we're learning something. Maybe we're getting a little better. Maybe there's a little more hope that we can stare down these challenges and not be afraid to talk about them or seek the help that people deserve. What does this mean? What does this plan mean? It means that when someone has a problem, they can call a number and get a human being who will navigate for them, who will find the help they need and get them to it. It means if you're at a school and you're a principal or a teacher or a classroom aide and you see a child has a problem, We'll send a mental health professional to that school to figure out with you a plan to help that child get well. It simply means there will be more mental health care available and we will help people to reach the help that they deserve. It's as simple as that. And it's so important to talk about this problem because mental health problems, mental illness pervades every part of our city, every part of our society. Mental illness does not discriminate. It does not discriminate. It has no regard. It has no regard for race or income or gender or neighborhood. It afflicts us all. Early in life, late in life, in between. But we know it is preventable. We know it is treatable. We know we can stop problems from getting worse. We know that with the right help, people can turn their lives around. If you want some evidence, she's standing right here. We know that we can see a problem early in life with the right help. It never fully manifests. And we also know that the status quo 
regarding mental health is absolutely unacceptable. Because think about a status quo that doesn't even let us talk about the problem, let alone get people the help they need. And today, we begin a process. And it will take years. This one's not easy. We have taken on a lot of challenges. This may be one of the very toughest. It will take years. But we will address this problem. We will go ahead first at it. And we know people can get well. If we bring the pieces together, if we actually treat people as a whole, if we bring all the strands together, people can get well. People have needed something like this for a long time. And even though it will take years, it must begin today. It must begin. It must begin aggressively with all we have because the people of this city deserve nothing less. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor de Blavio, uh, for sharing your story. And um, thank both of you uh, for your leadership and your unwavering commitment to our city's wellness. Um, before I introduce our, our next speaker, I want to uh, acknowledge a few more of our guests. Congresswoman Elliot Engel is here. <laughs> Assemblyman Guillermo Linares is here. And I believe somewhere is Councilwoman Lori Cumbo. Uh, we have one more story to share um, and to give, uh, I want to thank him also for coming to share his story and to give us another perspective on why building a stronger mental health system is so important for our city. It's my pleasure to introduce Mike Thompson, Principal of Global Human Resource Services at Price Waterhouse Cooper. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. This is, a, this is really an incredible event, an incredible initiative. Uh, I think as you heard, I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a partner with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, and I specialize in health care and benefits. Um, you know, a, a couple years ago, our firm actually looked at the economics, uh, the total cost of brain disease in the U.S., and it determined that uh, in a given year, we spend almost a trillion dollars in economic value because of brain disease. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is business actually understands that more of that is not related to the cost of care, but actually the cost in terms of productivity, performance, and the impact that has on, on our economy. Uh, a few weeks ago, we actually had a, a uh, summit on mental health down on Wall Street uh, at the New York Stock Exchange, incredible event. Uh, and we brought together CEOs, uh, mental health leaders, and, this, and the, uh, the mayor's, mayor's office uh, to talk about mental health. And what was really interesting is when the CEOs talked about it, they didn't talk about it in the context of illness. They talked about people and they talked about how their people, they want them to have their A game. And, and you know, from that standpoint, I think it, it, you know, this affects us all. It's not every, you know, it's not just uh, uh, others outside of our, our workforces. But beyond that, what was interesting is that they all, all shared personal stories about how it had affected them, how it affected their families, how it affected their friends. And I think that can't be surprising to us, you know, given that one in five people are affected by mental illness. You know, some people are actually affected in, in a more serious way than others. Uh, some have actually experienced 
what I would say is tragic and, and painful loss, and, I, and I'm one of them. Um, my brother um, took his life, uh, committed suicide, um, a little about 30 years ago. And that experience um, never goes away. It has an impact on how you think about the world, uh, how you think about yourself, and how you think about how you react to others uh, going forward. But in spite of the fact that one in five experience some sort of mental health issue, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. So what's, what's encouraging, though, is some of the leading companies here in New York and elsewhere are starting to break that silence. They're actually taking action by uh, starting programs within their workforce to get people talking. And the results are simply incredible. What happens, I always describe it as, uh, it's like waiting to exhale. It's like, <sighs> finally, you know, finally we can talk. And people share, uh, they, they get engaged, uh, and, they, and frankly, they promise to listen without judgment. And that is an incredible transformation that's happening here in New York, across the nation, and for some of these corporations globally. It's really incredible uh, where some of this is heading. And of course, the, the, the purpose of these efforts for these companies and for our society is to break the back of that stigma. The stigma that stops two out of three people who need help from getting help. So, uh, finally, I, I just say that's not going to be enough. The reality is we've got a major problem with affordable access everywhere, but particularly here in New York City. Mm. And that's not an issue that really impacts the business executives, our business executives. They can afford but it impacts the average New Yorker. And it's an issue that I think we will only be addressed if we bring the stakeholders together to understand the issue and then to solve for it. Uh, it will take time, but it has to be addressed. Businesses do believe in the power of an engaged workforce, and they increasingly understand that the well-being of their workforce is foundational to their success and their sustainability. I think what we have found with these corporations that have gone above and beyond is that when they make that effort to break the silence, to, re to remove the stigma, the way people react is so positive. It's like they care about my well-being. It's a very positive reaction. So I, I just want to say today we have a tremendous opportunity to make a difference for people like us. I don't think this is an issue about them. It's about us, you know, our families, our friends, our coworkers. It's about us. And I think this is a tremendous opportunity. I, and finally, I just want to personally applaud the mayor, the first lady, and the mayor's office for making a bold and, and major statement about improving mental health in our community and may this grow beyond there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony with us. Uh, two more people to acknowledge, Dr. Herb Pardes, Executive Vice Chairman of New York Presbyterian. I also want to acknowledge Ayman El Mohandez, the Dean of the CUNY School of Public Health and a big partner of ours. <laughs> We're also joined today by the Chair of the City Council's Mental Health Committee. It's my honor to introduce Andy Cohen. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, 
first of all, I just want to say that the First Lady did not develop this plan in some office in City Hall. I, I personally saw her out in the field on many, many occasions in every corner of the city, really personally doing the work. When she says she listened, she means her personally. It was something that really she took ownership of and really led the way. So I want to say thank you again on behalf of, of everybody. I'll be very brief, but as long as it's a uh, bear your soul Monday, um, as a teenager, I, I had a problem with alcohol and substance abuse. Uh, and, uh, you know, I stand before you now 26 years and 350 some odd days later because, <laughs> because my, my family was able to get the resources that I needed to get help. Uh, but that's not the circumstances that so many New Yorkers find themselves in. And this administration really firmly believes that whether you get help is, should not be a function of your accident of birth. And so I want to say thank you again for that. This roadmap is really going to be transformative to people's lives. Uh, and the work here really starts today. And we're all rolling up our sleeves and ready to start doing it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, also share some remarks, Congressman Rangel. As you can tell, I've been around a long time. <laughs> I've been to a lot of press conferences that dealt with a lot of subject matters, but I have never attended a more educational or emotional presentation of a very serious human problem. The, the mayor and his family have actually not lectured to us, but shared how we all can be better people and help ourselves and other people. I want you to know I am more concerned about where do we go from here because a child is not born thinking that mental health is a stigma. A child has no idea about what racism is about or what country you came from or what rich and poor means. And so what we're trying to do here through the strength and courage of the first family of New York City is try to undo what we have done to ourselves. I have never felt more proud of being a public official because most of us truly believe that we have an obligation to improve the quality of life. I've always felt if we could only concentrate on something, and I made up my mind until today, it was education. But that's because I couldn't face up to the fact that if you have an illness that's mental, education doesn't mean that much to you. And so the reason I asked to speak, which my wife would say that's not very unusual, but believe me, it, <laughs> it really is, is because I want to reach out to the spiritual community. I think they have a tremendous obligation, but they can help. This is a difficult subject to talk about because first of all, we may be ill and we don't even know it. And worse than that, if we love somebody as they shared, how do you share with them that you want to help them without attaching a stigma to the love and help that you want to give? But if we thought from the beginning that this wasn't a stigma, if you say your corn hurts, damn it, your corn hurts, and you're not ashamed of it. <laughs> you know? And I know more about Latin and the Trinity and the several sacraments than you want to know. But that ain't helping me negotiate a peaceful marriage for over 50 years. Or what the hell am I going to do when I retire? You need help. <laughs> so I'm suggesting... We can't cope with the courage of this family. We can all say thank you for reaching out and picking a subject that you're not going to pick up any points on. And God knows we need this help in Washington more than ever, but that's another subject. 
But suppose, suppose we find some way to talk with people that talk with a higher authority and in our own way share with them that if we started out knowing as much about this subject as they talked us about our responsibilities on earth, if they would include in among their message that we have to help people to get help that goes beyond the Koran and the Torah and the Bible or the New Testament, because I'm leaving here as a person with a new challenge, and that is we should not have the word stigma attached to any type of problem we face in life. And so, I want to really thank the family. It's so easy, I think, to believe you recovered from anything. I know I have. But the fact that you believe that you can take your experiences and share them with someone else to allow them to do it a little better, I'm telling you, your family is that you are a lucky man, Mr. Mayor, to have a family that you can do it. And so we all have a mission. Don't let this ball that's been knocked in center field ever hit the ground. We're going to have to individually find some way to talk to somebody to try to share with them what we have learned today. And I think that would be our way of thanking this wonderful family. Isn't it great to be a New Yorker? All right. Thank you so much. Um, we'd, like not to, we'd like to now open the floor for on-topic questions. Uh, could we ask, because it was um, two years ago this Christmas Eve when we first heard from Kiara when the YouTube video right before you took office uh, was posted, could, could we just ask how Kiara is doing and, and uh, see what you think of all this? Kiara has not been briefed, <laughs> but I want you to know she's, as I said, she's well into recovery, and of course, this is a journey that no one ever leaves. is It's about um, living life in the most healthy and productive way, and we work at that every day, and I, she does too. Do you want to add to that, Kiara, in any way? All right, come on up. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, it definitely means a lot to me personally that so many people are invested in the mental health of our community. Um, I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> um, I would say that there's always challenges, and by no means is my my mental health or my life perfect. Um, but I think that the difference between a few years ago and now is that I have the tools to ensure that, you know. <laughs> now I have the tools to ensure that, um, you know, no matter how much I may be struggling with something, whether it's a problem in my life that my mental health amplifies or just, you know, another day where it's hard to get out of bed or anything. Um, you know, I have that hope. Um, the tool of hope really, I think, is something I developed that it will get better. And that's a gift that I could easily, you know, by circumstance not have been afforded. But today I'm grateful to say that I am able to see through to the other side. Any questions? For the mayor, you spoke very emotionally about your uh, relationship with your father and your family's efforts. 
to try and get him help, which, which you said he sort of brushed off. I'm wondering um, if that were happening now with this roadmap, how, how could a family who had a loved one who was refusing efforts to get them help, um, somebody who's an adult, not a child, does this address that? And um, how do you connect somebody who doesn't want help with the help they need? Yeah, I want to just frame the answer with first what that reality was and then speak to how now I think it really would be different. Uh, my dad would, you know, deny that he had an alcohol problem after many, many drinks. Like, you'd be sitting there, he'd be drinking after drink after drink, and he'd still say he didn't have a problem. My dad would say he could quit smoking any time he wanted. And he had a thing he did more than once where he would take the pack of cigarettes. He smoked uh, Marlboros, and he would take the, st the pack of cigarettes and throw it out the window of the car and say, see, I can quit anytime I want, except there was a whole carton in the glove compartment. <laughs> so, and this was, again, an extraordinarily intelligent, once upon a time, very accomplished guy. Um, what none of us understood was some of the things that could be done to help. And I first want to say our family is blessed because Chiara, for example, through her path, taught us about AA. I had, I had only the most stereotypical understanding of AA. I had seen you know, it portrayed in a few movies, sometimes sympathetically, sometimes not. But Chiara showed us and really educated all of us on what that type of program and many other good efforts could do that would change someone's life. And so I wished, I literally wished at times there was a time machine. I could like learn what I learned from Chiara and go back and try and reach my father. Um, but the difference today with this plan, and again, this is, this is going to be a long, a long road, and I thought Congressman Rangel spoke so powerfully about, and I thought it was beautiful, and I want to thank you, Charlie, that you know, no, none of us is born with this. So somehow as a society, we conspire to teach ourselves this stigma. And that's the, this giant barrier. But despite the stigma, what happens with this plan? If anybody knows of a person in their life they can call NYC support and find out how to help that person. And there will be a human being who will navigate that process for them. You, of course, want it to be, like in Chiara's case, the person themselves seeking help. But we know that's not always going to be the case. It could be your aunt, your uncle, your child, your friend. You can find a human being who's going to say, OK, here are the steps. We heard that such extraordinary, powerful testimony from Kathy. And you, I mean, I can't thank you enough for explaining what it feels like when you don't know the next step. We had our own version of that. But now we are literally starting next year going to have the capacity to say, here's what you do. And then I, the person on the other end of the line is going to follow up with you to make sure you got the appointment, to make sure it went well, to figure out what you need next. Because absent of that, a lot of people will simply stumble. They'll stumble through the darkness, finding, trying to find some way. Ms. McCray, can you just talk a little bit about NYC support? Would you say that's sort of the key to this roadmap? Uh, just listening to New Yorkers over the past 11 months, many of them talked about the fact that they didn't know how to navigate. Would you say that, that just making that support available, that human support, is, is the key to this whole plan? It is absolutely the key. So many people I spoke with said they want, they need, they need special care. We all need special care. Where we live, where we work, where we study, we need care in our language, in our neighborhoods. I, it's, it, this is a complicated city, and all of us are, you know, very different individuals, and you just can't send, it's not one-stop shopping. So to have someone, it's not one-stop shopping, right? Yes, yes. So to have someone help you navigate, so a real person, not, you know, not a machine, a real person to talk to, say, well, I'm concerned about this, or I'm concerned about that, or I'm, you know, I speak Cantonese, or I speak Spanish. To have someone on the other end of the line help you get to that appointment, check and make sure you got there, make sure there wasn't a six-month six waiting list. That matters so much. And remember, too, that when people are, are depressed, or say it's that person you know, who is suffering, it is really hard to reach out. It makes it that much harder to connect to the service. You wouldn't expect somebody with a broken leg to run down the street to get to the hospital. This is somebody who's depressed. Just making that phone call to make that appointment is, it's a lot. So having that support is, is, is key. Are they connected 
people to someone who will continue to walk with them? Because not everyone, say, has Medicaid, which you have managed care that comes along with that now. Right. You're absolutely right. Do you want to add to that? Okay. Yeah, New York City support uh, is designed not only to connect people to care in the first instance, but to make sure that people follow through in their care. So as you can imagine, uh, if you call for you or a loved one, not only will New York City support help you find that provider and make that appointment, they will make sure if in the interim you need ongoing counseling by phone or otherwise that you get it. After your appointment is in place, they will follow up with you to make sure that you follow through in your appointment, to make sure that you have a service plan moving forward, and to make sure that you are following up in that care. Um, so absolutely, it's about not just a one point in time connection, it's about making sure you get connected to the care that you need. Uh, Dr. Belkin, you want to add anything? Yeah, I encourage you all to read Thrive NYC. Because there is, that is, NYC support is key. There are tons of keys in this document. This is one of the most comprehensive, um, serious approaches by a city to take on a tremendous public health challenge. There are prevention keys. There are mental health promotion keys. There are easy access keys. There are peer support keys. There are early child intervention keys. There are a ton of keys. And we're serious about them, and we need all of them. Um, but connect this, this idea that people should be so in a maze uh, to reach care is obviously one of those key keys. <laughs> so of course, Dr. Belkin only said peer support, so he would get uh, applause. <laughs> um, <laughs> That one of the main issues on Staten Island is that there aren't a lot of actual places where you can get these types of services. I'm curious how the city can actually facilitate the creation of more services like this. And right now, in the meantime, Staten Island's also a transportation desert. So people who don't have a car, for instance, they can't get to the closest place. They might not be able to. So could you talk a little bit about that problem? Sure, I'll speak briefly and then uh, see if Dr. Belkin wants to add anything. Uh, a number of the initiatives, a number of the keys in uh, Thrive NYC are about increasing capacity uh, throughout the city. And that's capacity not only in traditional settings like a mental health facility, but actually bringing capacity to the places where people go and spend their regular lives. So bringing capacity to schools. Uh, a lot of initiatives here are about increasing the capacity of schools to provide mental health services and supports to their uh, students. Um, uh, the mental health core, which uh, the First Lady spoke about. Uh, not only are we placing mental health professionals in the field, but we're placing many of them, most of them in fact, in primary care settings, pediatricians' offices, uh, places that people are normally regularly going to and connecting to, which both increases access because it's closer, it's easier to get to, but also starts to remove some of the barriers that we placed in our minds uh, between uh, the physical body and the mental self, uh, so that you don't feel like mental health is not something extra, it is a part of your health care. It's one of the uh, one of the guiding principles of Thrive NYC. Um, so yes, a lot of what's in the roadmap is about bringing capacity to other places. Uh, peer support. I'm not going to milk that too many times, but peer, but peer support. Um, but but seriously, like creating other alternatives uh, that create other connections to care, including through non, including not through uh, mental health professionals, peer supporters who are trained to provide that kind of support. A lot of evidence that shows the power of that kind of treatment. Uh, the congressman talked about the clergy. Um, one of the things that we found that the first lady heard going around the city is that even when people were not comfortable talking to their doctor or finding a mental health professional, they might speak to their imam or their minister or their uh, rabbi. Uh, and so part of the Thrive NYC is about giving those folks the tools to be better advocates and to better connect people to care. So we are absolutely committed to making sure that in every part of this great city, anyone who needs care over time will be able to get it. Dr. Belkin, anything you want to add? Damn good. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty excellent. Um, we really can reimagine where mental health can happen, and, and you'll see a lot of uh, both care and prevention can happen in lots of different places, including lots more people, and a lot of the initiatives really reflect that. Um, but also, I, I won't embarrass anyone, but we have people from uh, health insurance plans in the room, and we are very aware 
that if we're going to put this kind of challenge out there, we, the city is going to engage new partners, um, payers, other levels of government, um, other uh, provider systems uh, to get on the roadmap with us um, and achieve these goals. Um, thank you. I'm here with the National Association of um, Social Workers. And um, here in this great school of social work, we we're have... Only, I'm sorry. We're only, we're only taking press questions at this moment, okay? All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to follow directions. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, we were both curious. <coughs> Exactly. A lot of healthcare professionals say that there's a shortage of psychiatrists, psychologists, as it is, um, to treat mental health problems. How exactly does this increase that capacity? Are you incentivized? In, in underserved neighborhoods, you can't force somebody into Medicaid or Medicare into accepting it, or you can't force someone into... Uh, working with the insurance provider, how mm -hmm. are you, how exactly are you doing that in this? The first lady's going to take that question. I was going to start and say that that's actually one of the keys in the roadmap is that we have to build capacity. Um, it's not about just about psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers. It's about peer specialists. It's about. <laughs> it's true, no, it's true. It's, it's really true. And it's about building capacity by training people who already do this work. I mean, there's... <laughs> you know, clergy is an excellent example, but there are also people in community-based organizations that, that do this work every day in, in other ways, and they can be trained to help people who are, are suffering or to be able to refer people to a higher level care if needed. And I, I want to add to that that we're also training 250,000 New Yorkers in mental health first aid. That is going to add to our capacity tremendously. People will be able to identify symptoms and, and, and do, again, treatment for some very common disorders, but also be able to refer people to more care if they need it. Uh, Dr. Belkin, do you want to? Oh, Mary first? Okay. Uh, I uh, just want to extend on the idea that the role of people in providing mental health care services doesn't belong solely to people you've mentioned, the psychiatrist, the social worker, the psychologist, or it also, in addition to our beloved peer specialist. It includes primary care uh, providers, uh, pediatricians, and internists. So when I was a medical student, it was endocrinologists who looked after people with diabetes, super specialists. Now it's a primary care issue, just the same way. We have, as part of the mental health core, people who are trained psychiatrists and psychologists who will be working with practices to increase the skills of primary care providers the pediatricians who talk to the moms, remember, not only the kids, as well as adult care providers, and help equip them with more comfort and skills to begin to tackle these issues in primary care settings. Additionally, we have a huge challenge to expand capacity, as uh, the First Lady has said, and we're going to be having a summit um, in which we gather together members of the profession to talk about ways to bolster our capacity. You've all heard about the notion of task sharing, task shifting, uh, ways that we can bring more resources to bear uh, and make sure that we can address these issues in the short term and, and the long term. Thank you very much. In addition to everything that Dr. Bassett said and the First Lady said, remember we're here at Hunter for a reason. Um, schools like Hunter generate hundreds of professionals every year, or graduate every year, and right now there aren't necessarily the placements in community uh, in primary care facilities uh, in the community for them to go to. By creating places like the Mental Health Corps, by creating jobs in the community, providing direct care, um, we are creating the places for that capacity to come forward.
Um, let's come back to the front. Um, on on my subway ride here, I was on a subway car with a man who was uh, seemed to be extremely mentally ill, um, and. I know there are New Yorkers who every day interact with somebody, sometimes on their commute or their walk to work, who see somebody who is dealing with extreme mental illness. I'm wondering <coughs> how this roadmap addresses people like that. And as a New Yorker, uh, what should you do, if anything, when you encounter someone like that? Okay. Dr. Belkin, you want to take the answer on the So um, after this press conference, I can sign you up for a mental health first aid course. Um, but really, but really empowering ourselves with knowledge is one step to be a good citizen to people who are having trouble. And so I'm going to take your question too, because there were sort of two questions there. What about that? I think you used the phrase extreme mentally ill. Um, this uh, roadmap uh, reprises a lot of things we've already announced, real commitments to um, meet on the street that population new mobile treatment capabilities, um, new abilities to connect people back to care and then follow up with that provider that they stay in care. Those are both under the NYC SAFE program uh, that is now up and running. Um, and uh, obviously the commitment uh, that was just shown the past week in um, supportive housing and a huge expansion of supportive housing. Um, so there is, so the short answer is there's a lot in Thrive NYC for, for, for the man you encountered on the subway. But that man didn't get that way on the subway overnight. Um, and so we need precisely the whole menu of things in this strategy uh, that get people, reach people sooner, that make it easier for them to get care, that explode access uh, in terms of many more options. Um, we need it to make sure that people don't spiral down into finding themselves in that condition uh, on a subway. But we also, that's not the reason, the only reason why we are doing all this in, in Thrive NYC is to prevent somebody ending up in that condition on a subway. It's because one in five New Yorkers have uh, experienced mental illness in a given year. Um, and while we, we don't have to choose being concerned about one man over, over another, um, and we need to appreciate uh, that while a lot of attention, sensationalized attention, I think, goes to the extreme problems, um, there is a lot of uh, cost to the larger problem. Depression kills. Substance use robs people of their lives and both destroy families. And so we are stepping up to that problem. And the fix for both is the similarly comprehensive menu that we're, that we're uh, putting out today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would also add that, of course, New Yorkers should always remember that if you see someone that you think needs help, call 311. That triggers our response uh, from the Department of Homeless Services or otherwise to go get that person help. Um, so we should always remember that we can use the tools that we have available to us already. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and at the first let you remind us we also have an app. You can use it uh, from an app as well. Along those lines, um, you can't talk about mental illness without talking about the homeless crisis. This is a question for Mayor de Blasio. This is something that has only increased for the past few years, now 60,000 in homeless shelters. And there's been criticism over the city has handled that, that it's only gotten worse. What is your response to that and how mental illness and this plan will help improve the lives of the homeless? I appreciate the question. I think we have to really look this in the face. We have what we used to know as the homelessness crisis, which was very largely the result of deinstitutionalization decades ago, and people who had very serious mental health issues and substance abuse issues and did not have a place to go. There, you know, when deinstitutionalization happened, there were supposed to be all sorts of alternative places created, halfway houses and other places created for people who were suffering. Guess what happened? They weren't created. People were just let go out on the streets. And that was so much of what we saw in homelessness uh, over the last decades. What then started to happen more and more was economically based homelessness. And I, it's always been, there's always been some of that, especially as the cost of housing and the cost of living has increased in the city over the last 15 or 20 years. But it really jumped uh, when the Great Recession hit. And then when a series of decisions were made by government 
uh, to stop providing some of the rental subsidies that kept people out of shelter. So you can look at sort of, unfortunately, the phases of the growth of this problem. When I was General Welfare Committee Chair in the City Council, uh, in the last decade, we thought 35,000 people in shelter was, you know, inordinate and unprecedented. And you can see how before that it had grown in waves. And then, again, both because of the recession, the, the, the horrible one-two punch of recession undercutting people's uh, wages and salaries and people losing their jobs while the cost of housing kept going up. I mean, it makes no sense how those two things went together, but they did. So more and more people just found that the, the bottom fell out for their families economically. And again, some of the city and state efforts that stood and in the way of people being evicted or in the way of people ending up in shelter were taken away. So there's no question this problem has grown and has become a more difficult, especially because it's more about economics. Um, I think the difference here is to recognize what more and more of our homeless families go through is, and you'll see this in the statistics, they're families, first of all, not individuals as much as it used to be. They are people who are working <coughs> or were working recently. So there are people who are economically viable. They could just find uh, enough income and a place that they could afford to live. For those folks, what we're talking about today has no bearing, honestly. This is about addressing people with uh, mental health and substance abuse problems, and that's actually fewer and fewer of the people coming through the doors of our shelters. But of course, there are still a number of people in our shelters, and obviously the vast majority of the people who are on the street 24 hours, which at this moment we believe is between three and 4,000 people who make the street their home permanently. For those folks, obviously, substance abuse and mental health problems are predominant. And what I think the difference will be now is that the capacity we've been building up uh, you certainly see changes in how the Department of Homeless Services goes out and reaches people and tries to get them into some kind of uh, help. Uh, NYPD has done a lot more to train officers in how to be a part of that process. The additional safe havens we've added, which is going to be about 500 uh, safe havens over time that are going to allow us uh, to get people in who haven't been willing to go to bigger shelters but will go to, say, a house of, house of worship with a few beds and with people there they trust so that they can get to the substance abuse and the uh, mental health services they need. And if that works, if you can get them to the services and keep them in those services, they will then go either to a shelter or ideally to supportive housing, but not back to the streets. But I think the biggest answer to your question is this is an effort that starts in earnest in the coming months. You'll start to feel the effects as we go into next year. And the more, the more we reach people, the more we undercut some of the trends in terms of mental health and substance abuse that we've experienced for generations. And they've gone unanswered in large part. So what we want to do is go to the root. And if every year we can reduce the number of people whose mental illness and substance abuse problems spiral out of control, we will inevitably reduce the amount of homelessness in this city in the coming years. Right, time for just a couple more questions. Uh, Follow up on, on her question. Does that mean the mental health core and maybe the mental health first aid won't or will be available to in, in homeless shelters or extended <coughs> homeless shelters? Yeah, the mental health first aid, in fact, where our goal is to train a quarter million New Yorkers over the next five years. But many of the first uh, wave of those trains will be for city employees, including uh, staff at DHS shelters, um, school staff, et cetera. All right, last question. Um, yeah. Um, the mayor. I'm sorry. Good. Sorry, uh, you spoke a lot about shattering the stigma and about how your daughter came forward and found recovery by coming forward. I was just curious, you, you have a lot of mental health history in your family. Have you personally ever sought mental health services? Have you considered going to an Al-Anon meeting or anything of that nature? In the, on the Al-Anon meeting, we talked with Kiara over time, and you know, for a period of time it looked like something that we should do, but I have to say, honestly, um, I don't mean to brag in front of you, and I know that uh, recovery is an everyday thing, but Kiara's recovery has been extraordinary and fast, and as I said, she turned around and has put a lot of time into helping others. 
So I think once upon a time we assumed that might be something we would be doing, but at this point it feels like she's in a very good place, and if that ever is something that she thinks we should do or we think we should do, we would. For myself, um, back when I was in uh, graduate school for a time, I was going through some challenges and I, I sought some counseling for like a few weeks. I found it helpful, but honestly at that point thought like a few weeks was good and I felt, you know, I got a few things off my chest and felt better. And a lot of uh, friends like talked things through with me and that helped. And I think that is an example of the fact that I think one of the most important messages here today, that help comes in many forms. And um, it, it can be uh, someone in your life. Uh, it could be someone with the first aid training. It could be a peer. It could be your family doctor. It could be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. It could be, you know, a rehab program. It, it takes many, many forms. For me, you know, that limited experience was successful. But I think the important thing is to be very comfortable with whatever it is. And I remember, you know, back, this was many years ago, but I remember thinking, you know, was this something somehow to be ashamed of? And I literally said to myself, why am I even asking myself that question? And it was exactly what Charlie said. It's, it's in all of us, and we have to get it out of all of us. That is, uh, that is everybody's business. A stigma is, in effect, I think Charlie said it very, very powerfully, a, a stigma is almost a social contract. If we keep it going, if we keep building it, it will do just fine. If we refuse it, if we deny it, if we resist it, we can break it down. Thank you. So, uh, thank, uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, just for the press, the mayor's gonna hold off topic in conference room 155 behind us. Everyone else, thank you very much for being here.